Welcome to Decision Space, the only podcast that takes place right here between the turns of your favorite game. My name's Jake. And I'm Brendan. And today we are talking about the decisions in the castles of Burgundy. But before we do that, I want to just make a note. I was uh, visiting my parents last week and I did the really intelligent intellectual move of leaving my personal computer over there. So we are recording this week's episode and I'll be later editing on a backup, my work computer. Uh, So, you know, if this doesn't have all of, I'm going to do my best to like include our music and stuff, but if this doesn't have all the same bells and whistles that we've had in some of our past podcasts, I apologize for that. And and hopefully we'll get back on track uh, in, in the next couple of weeks there's no turbulence in castles of burgundy anyways yeah right so no need (laughs) (laughs) all right well before we get into our main topic let's jump right into a little segment we like to call where is my mind brendan why don't you get started by telling us something that's on your mind this week well, first and foremost, I'm very impressed that you actually called the uh, the segment the name that we'd set out on calling it a few weeks ago, a few months ago at this point, since we've been fumbling it so much. But my mind is on a uh, game that Maya and I, my wife, recently played and picked up. We went on a little vacation. I talked about last episode to the beach. I always love getting new games at the beach, and we went to we found a really cool little game store. And fans of the show will know that. I really enjoy The Fox in the Forest, and Maya does too, and we actually picked up The Fox in the Forest duet, which is a cooperative version of sort of the same system. Uh, It features all different cards, and you're basically playing a cooperative trick-taking game where you're over three rounds trying to collect all of these different gems on the board. Do you have any experience with this game, Jake? I don't. I'm really excited to hear you talk about it, though. Okay, so it the four fans of Fox in the Forest, um, it's basically... the deck is almost completely the same. Uh, and for people who don't know Fox in the Force, it's really interesting. So there's three suits and 30 cards overall. And the odd value cards have special powers when they're played. And the even value cards uh, are just sort of regular cards. But this game actually integrates a, a little twist to that. So there's still the deck sort of takes that same form, but there's different powers because it's sort of a tug of war game where whenever you win tricks, you're moving in the direction of the player who won the trick on this track between these two different forests, um, trying to collect gems by landing on specific spaces along the track. And every card that each player will play has a number of uh, paw prints on it. And you move the combination uh, of paw prints between the two cards that were played. So Jake, if let's say you played a card with, with three paw prints and I played one with two, uh, and I won the trick, we would move five spaces in my direction. Okay. So it becomes this like interesting push-pull where you're trying to have the right player win tricks at the right time and also move the right uh, distance along the track to land on spots that still have gems and pick them up. The gems get sort of added between rounds, um, and it, it definitely has the game of working against the against the game, two players cooperatively, but it's a limited communication game. So you can't tell your teammate what cards are in your hand or what you're going to play, which is very, very difficult for my wife, Maya. She, I would play a card and she'd be like, what are you doing? Um, which can be tough because trick-taking games, you know, sometimes we've talked about how they, uh, at least when in each atom of the trick, uh, each time you get a new hand, it wa- uh, wanes in terms of decision spaces. So sometimes you find yourself just making a decision where it's like, I had no other choice choice um but i think the powers are really clever it's definitely a game that i would like to play more some of the powers allow you to move in the opposite direction of who would win the trick or there's a card uh called gift it's the seven value card that lets you you play it and then you swap uh you each randomly choose a card and give it to the other player. So you can really get to set each other up in an interesting way. The one power that remains the same is the fox, which lets you switch the decree card or the trump card for normal trick taking. I don't know. It's fun. I would say I would love to play it with you at some point, Jake, knowing that you've played and enjoyed Fox in the Forest a little bit less than me, but still enjoyed it. Yeah, that sounds really cool. Um, My only experience with cooperative trick taking is the crew, uh, which I don't think you've played yet. I have But you absolutely need to. Um, but similarly, that has the same kind of 
uh, limited communication, which I think is just such a fun aspect in cooperative games because it, it just always really leads to like these emotionally resonant moments that are either like really frustrating or really funny as you um, aren't on the same page or like, you know, the al- alternative to that is you are on the same page and you have this like moment of synchronization where you like mind meld with someone and that's super cool. To, to experience and feel as well so i i like these kind of games and i'm sure i would enjoy that one as well so maybe one to add to my list i'd love to give it a try sometime yeah definitely and i would say even in our first game my and i in the fox in the forest duet had those synchronization moments where we felt like we were communicating through the cards and it's just that's just bliss it's totally. like great design yeah. what's on your mind jake so i uh have as normal been listening to a bunch of board game podcasts um I'm I'm a fan of so many in this space and driving back without my computer, but driving back nonetheless from my parents' house in Kansas <laughs> afforded me a lot of time to catch up on some of my favorites. And I just wanted to highlight um, how cool it was listening to this most recent episode of Board Game Barrage. I imagine most of the people listening to this podcast might already be subscribed to that feed as well. Um, if not, it's uh, four, ho- three or four hosts um, that do a really great job of uh, bringing a lot of fun, banter, and energy to their discussions of games and, and gaming topics. It's a high recommend from me. Uh, but anyway, in their most recent episode, they did a little feature on your game, Enchanted Plumes. Um, and that was just such a cool thing to see. I've... Um, you know, it's so funny, the board game hobby, when you're starting out, it feels so big. But the more I engage with it, interact with people, uh, the smaller and smaller this world starts to become. Um, and and this was just another really sweet moment of kind of the, I guess, kind of the distance between me and the hobby that I really like to engage with felt felt a little smaller. I felt a little uh, a friendship with, with the hosts over there. And, and uh, you know, obviously my connection with you in that game, it was just a really cool moment and, and really fun to hear people that I've listened, you know, for hours and hours talk about game to talk about one of yours. So I just wanted to point that out and I'd encourage anyone listening to this podcast to head over there and, and give that a listen as well. Yeah, well put, Jake. It's I always li- love listening to Board Game Garage because you just get to sort of listen in to friends talking about games, which is very fun. And I will say for me, it was an extra special treat because not often do you get to listen pe- to people talk about your game, or at least not for me. And I would say that uh, I, my heart basically melted when I heard Mark say the words, we played the game and it was good. And then I just kept thinking about it or something close to that. And that's that was just like, OK, slam dunk home run. We actually listened to it in the Maya and I together in the drive, the drive home. She'd never listened to an episode before with me. And she was like, wow, they actually like your game. I was like, thanks. <laughs> yeah. uh, it seems like they actually do. <laughs> how nervous were you when uh, really nervous yeah yeah <laughs> highly nervous i had no idea what what was going to be going down and i actually i had interacted uh a little bit uh with kellen on twitter and knew that he was having some difficulty with the the cult the 10 different colors in the games which is something that um i always knew was going to be difficult about the game and i hate that because it has 10 colors that it puts an undue burden on colorblind players to sort of, it makes it harder. And I, I, but I really appreciated him speaking to that and sort of talking through it. And actually my brother-in-law is also colorblind and we've been playing the game over the weekend. So it's just really interesting hearing those perspectives too. Awesome. Well, hopefully your uh, brother-in-law was equally understanding as Kellen about the (laughs) the frustration of grappling with all those color hues. My brother-in-law, Lionel, definitely, uh, we were playing lots of three-player games, which I think makes it a little bit easier to sort of see the center of the feathers, the the table's a little bit tighter, and he got the hang of it fairly quickly. But it always, it's a little bit more work, which makes me feel bad. No. Yeah. All right. Well, (laughs) let's hop off of that topic and go right in to our feature today, this is the Castles of Burgundy episode. I think it's a, an episode we've always known we would get around to sooner 
rather than later. And I'm excited that it is upon us. So let's jump right in to our ratings and slogans for this great game. Uh, and because I am the host this week, Brendan, I'm going to make you go first. Amazing. I am doing a terrible job as a co-host because I wrote a synopsis, but I don't have it pulled up. So I am really quickly while I'm pulling it up, going to give a little decision space fact, which is that when Jake and I decided to do the podcast together, Castles of Burgundy was actually the first game that we played uh, just together online on Yukata. It was like we were just going to do you want to just play a Castle of Burgundy together? And we jumped in. But uh, so fun little way to sort of bring the podcast full circle in a sense now at this point. So here's my synopsis. The Castles of Burgundy is a bit like building a house, except you don't always have the tools you need. Sometimes your neighbor walks across the street and takes your hammer. Other times the supplies you ordered never arrive. And that veranda you are going to build as the focal point, well, turns out you're just going to have to settle for a porch. Steffenfeld's Castles of Burgundy is a treatise on the benefits of interlocking systems in game design. By interlocking several rather straightforward systems, systems the game's decision space blossoms and the dice input system adds just the right amount of uncertainty to make the decision space crunchy and rewarding without paralysis 9.5 sheep out of 10 fantastic well put and uh, uh, uh high marks but let's see if i can do a little better <laughs> <laughs> give you my hammer back okay well, let's hear it. let me hear it let me hear it Castles of Burgundy is a game that, since I first played it, has really inspired me. And I've always wanted to take the time to sit down and, and do a written review. Uh, I used to do that a lot more often for this game. But I could never find the words to mm. to really uh, capture the essence of this game, which is why I'm so excited that this podcast is, is going to afford me the opportunity to really talk through it with you. So... I know I couldn't do this game justice with a slogan, so I'm not going to try beyond just saying if, if for Euro style board games, this is as good as it gets. 10 out of 10 for me. Wow. Jake's first 10 out of 10. <laughs> Play the bugles. <laughs> oh, wait. Sorry. We can't edit this week. My bad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this is. Castle of Burgundy, designed by Stefan Feld, published in 2011 by Aaliyah and Ravensburger, a game for two to four players and currently ranked as number 15th best game of all time by the illustrious users of Board Game Geek. So, decision, interdecisional spaceship, run the audio log for Castles of Burgundy, rules overview. The Castles of Burgundy is a dice-driven, tile-laying game played over the course of 25 turns. In the Castles of Burgundy, players to work to build out a personal player board which depicts spaces for animal tiles, ship tiles, mine tiles, knowledge tiles, building tiles, and castle tiles. Each space on a player's board shows a die value and a color depending on the type of tile from those I mentioned previously, and only tiles matching the color depicted on a player's board may be placed in those spots. For example, green castle tiles may only ever be placed in a player's green tile areas on their board. At the start of each round, each player at the table takes and rolls two personal dice. The values rolled become the inputs for every action a player may take on their turn, in their pursuit to fill in regions on their board with tiles and perhaps ship out some goods along the way. There are four core actions in the Castles of Burgundy. One, taking new tiles from the supply and adding them to the storage area of your player board. Two, moving a tile from the storage area on, of your board to the play area of your board. Three, selling goods. Or four, gaining two workers. The choices available to a player in each action are dictated by their die values when they roll the dice. For example, when taking the first action, which allows you to take a new tile, you'll choose from a shared area on the board, which has tiles at six locations, each corresponding to a potential die value. If one of the dice you rolled is a three, and you're using your three value roll to take this action, then you may only take from the three value area from that tile selection space. Workers, however, are special tiles that can be spent to allow you to increase or decrease the value of your rolls by one, or more if you spend more worker tiles 
And these worker tiles offer some flexibility to the player, but they have to be used discerningly. Likewise, when placing a tile on your board, each potential location depicts a die value. So not only must you match the color of your tile to the color of on your board where you, where you would like to place that tile, you must also use a die value that matches the die value depicted on the space you're playing to, using workers to adjust if needed, and if you have any handy. So for example, if I have a castle location on my board that's value five, depicting value five, and I roll a five and take the place a tile from my storage to the board action, using that five dice, I could place my castle tile on the five location without using any workers. Players receive points for finishing contiguous areas of the same tile type and compete with other players to be the first to finish all of a color on their boards. For example, the player to finish all of the blue tiles on their boards receives a large bonus, and the second player to do that will get a smaller bonus. In a three or four player game, the other players, well, there's no bonus remaining for them. Points also come from placing animal tiles, selling goods, certain buildings, and knowledge tiles, so there's many point paths vying for the player's attention. After 25 turns, the player with the most points is declared the victor. The Castles of Burgundy has a lot going on, so as always, I re recommend having a quick look at the board or game setup to get an even better sense for the game. Wow, Brendan, that was a really fantastic role, rules overview. I'm so glad you recorded that and uploaded it to our uh, spaceships interface so that we could play it back on demand for the good folks listening to this podcast. So uh, hopefully that gives you a little bit of an idea of how to play if you haven't played already. Um, and now it is time to start talking about the decisions in Castles of Burgundy. So let's start out, as we always do, by talking through the decision space, what those decisions feel like, how big is this decision space we're exploring, and what type of decision space is this? Oh, this is... The Castles of Burgundy is just, I feel like, such a hard game to tackle with the lenses that we have in some ways because it, it's so interesting the, the, the ways that it plays out so your board in front of you that you're always playing tiles to is just a, a waning decision space purely right uh it starts very open and you have lots of numbers available to you and then as the game goes on you're you're closing and closing and closing the possible decisions that you can make quite literally though it never wanes to zero and every round there's this really interesting dynamic where the tiles available are waning, but the goods available could be going up, but could also be pulled out. So the, the feel of the game in terms of the type of decision space, it, it's like there are elements that are quite dynamic. And then also I would say elements that just strictly wane, but also every turn the, you have this really tight constrained input of I'm going to roll my two dice and that's going to just dictate so much of what I can do. And then you add the workers that just adds that little, you know, like you get served something at a restaurant and it just has the really nice crunchy onions on, or something on top. It's just that little extra piece of bite that, that adds so much to the decision space. What do you think about sort of the characterization of type, Jake? If you had to put it in a category, where would you put it? Well, so I would push back a little bit about the strictly waning decision space on your board in front of you, because it, while it's true, you have you as you play tiles to your estate as you're building up, that's less spots that you have. But quite often, you can mm. make intelligent choices to place a tile so that you actually are leaving yourself more available numbers or types of areas. Uh, than you had previously. So I think in that way, it, it functions a little bit dynamically. Would you agree with that? I think that that's really fair. And I think highlights the uh, really important design decision that Steffenfeld made, which was the size of your estate. It's designed in a way that you'll... Have you ever played a game where you've seen someone fill in your board completely? I haven't looked at the math of if it's even possible, but I so, think it's pretty much impossible. Yeah, it's literally impossible. Uh, there's yeah, there's okay. a thread on Board Game Geek about it. It's really interesting. Um, I think with the caveat, 
uh, I think there's some expansion, like mini expansions of the game that if you play with those, it can be possible. But if you're talking about the base game, uh, which is what we're talking about today, uh, the best you can possibly do is one empty spot, which hmm. kind of infuriates me <laughs> just because <laughs> like, I would love it if it was like, if, if it was, uh, like you know a one in a thousand chance of doing it like that would just be so cool uh but i think all with all you know the most the best possible outcomes everybody's everything's going absolutely optimally you come up something like one silver short oh (laughs) see i kind of agree with you i i wonder (laughs) As a safeguard, it totally makes sense, but it'd be so interesting if you could play a perfect game of the Castles of Burgundy, right? Like a perfect game of bowling. Um, and to be able to brag about that feat would be really amazing. I mean, you still can. You can fill in everything but one, but there's something about like, what if the perfect game in bowling was like 299 instead of 300? You know, it doesn't feel quite the same. Yeah, absolutely. And um, there's many games like patchwork is is a good example of one where it's like nearly impossible but doable and when somebody does complete their uh quilt or or whatever uh, you know they rush to f- twitter t- and facebook and post the picture and they're like look what i've done and you don't quite get that in in castles of burgundy so that that is a, a tiny little knock against the game in terms of its uh, bingo ability um <laughs> So, all right, maybe maybe it's a nine point nine 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 nine. All right, so yeah, we got a little bit sidetracked there, but to bring it back to your original question about the feel of the decision space uh, and the overall structure of it, using our waxing, waning, dynamic, and static framework, I think the best description of this game is actually one originally coined by. Uh, a user in our Discord, uh, Inder, who called Castles of Burgundy a punctuated dynamic space, decision space, meaning that while the decision space grows and shrinks over the course of the game, it's actually doing so on regular intervals. And those intervals are the beginning of each turn when the board refills with available tiles uh, increasing players' options, and then over the course of each round, it shrinks <laughs> down again. Uh, so I think that is a really, you know, a, a perfect example of um, a perfect way to describe this game. So I, that that's what I think it is, at least to me. Yeah, I think that's really well put. And in terms of feel, um, I think drafting games often there's the potential for meanness. To, to be experienced, right, with in terms of hate drafting. But I've found that the Castles of Burgundy, at least for me, rarely feels mean. I think mostly because almost all the tiles are so are equally useful or mostly useful outside of the animals, which are a sort of separate thing. And when you sort of specialize into certain buildings about the same. So it never feels that mean when someone takes their turn and sort of specifically grabs something. Um, I, I don't know. I think it really depends a lot on player count. At two players, uh, the game gets a lot meaner and scores are just lower across the board uh, (laughs) because then it has the dynamic, as so many two-player games do, where, you know, one point taken away from an opponent is just as good as one point gained for yourself. Where in a four-player game, um, it's really difficult to justify sort of hate drafting a tile um, over one that's just going to benefit your strategy. Um, because in that case, sure, you could take away four points from an opponent, um, but that's just the net gain to the two other players that were not involved in that interaction. Um, so that said, there's still good, there's still times for it. Uh, you just have to really choose your spot and make sure that you're not only hurting somebody, but that it's still useful to you. So I think it definitely gives it a feel of, of a friendlier game, you know, not not a take that game, especially at high player counts. But there there are there's definitely the opportunity to do that. And in the last <laughs> round, when there's one boat left and somebody takes it just so you can't complete a big area, 
Um, th- that doesn't feel great. You feel That's- that. That's very fair. And I think that actually links up to sort of my final thoughts on the decision space, Jake, or at least this first part. And I'm not saying we have to close the episode after this. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) There's lots more to say. (laughs) Decision space episode. Have a good week, Um, (laughs) y'all. One thing that strikes me about the decision space that sort of, I think, at odds with some of the other games that we've covered recently, maybe not completely, uh, but that sets it apart in some ways is I feel like the way in which I am given goals and then can accomplish them is very consistently rewarding throughout the game. I feel like when we've been talking about the game, Jake, we've talked about how it always feels like you're doing something good on a given turn. And I think part of that is even in turn, there's, it's rare that you take an action where you don't get significantly closer to your end goal. Um, Even if that's, so early in the game, you get lots of bonus points for com- for completing spaces. So filling in a single tile slot feels amazing. You didn't. You literally in one play end up getting like ten points in round number one plus one for finishing it. So eleven points that can feel great. Um, and I think it just sort of as that scales, it's really good at sort of having these like small goals and then larger goals and even larger goals that you work through towards throughout the game that layer really interestingly in a way that's just really rewarding. That I. I feel like even though in Lost Ruins of a game like Lost Ruins of Arnak, where I feel like it's constantly throwing things at you, it really felt like I had accomplished as much because the discrete goals of filling in your board, because they are discrete in some ways, and you're like chunking away at greater goals, whether that's you know finishing a, a larger area or just being the first to finish all of a specific color on your board. It just it feels good to take a bite of a sandwich and to have accomplished something while finishing the sandwich. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. It's very rare that at any turn in Castles of Burgundy isn't satisfying in multiple ways. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, really the only time that you feel like well, that kind of sucks is if you have to just take workers, uh, you know, because that action is just not as good as anything else. And and there, there are times maybe because you've boxed yourself in the corner or, you know, your opponent is picking on you or it's just the end of a round and you've sort of uh, exhausted the resources you had available. And you're like, well, I guess I just take workers. That doesn't feel good. Um, but, you know, <sighs> that that is also right. An, a necessary reminder of okay how could i have done this differently you know could i have played this out in a different order to have done something more with this turn i think it's also an example of the design just being so brilliant because even in your first few plays of the game taking workers feels like a fail case and i think that's really effective <laughs> because it teaches you right away like you're like oh gosh i got the consolation prize on my turn right. like you're going to throw me two workers like this feels awful and you know like even in your first few plays of the game you're not like sitting down at the table and going oh i want to take the worker action unless you get the knowledge tile that's like sort of makes it better and then maybe sometimes you are but for the most part it just it's this really good bad feel moment that works really effectively and i think maybe in a lesser game a design would have said oh this shouldn't feel so punitive but like no it's good your turn has fail cases and like you have to just put your your face down in your hands and be sad and it really is like the game just telling you like you you're not doing so good huh i guess you need a little bit extra help to solve this yeah. puzzle here here yeah. here have a little extra help this is going to make it a little easier for you next time um so yeah that that is pretty pretty funny how it's just like literally like little help tokens that just make things a bit easier like oh you couldn't quite work that out here here you go yeah but yeah and i i think so the turn's satisfying because it always feels like you're accomplishing a lot in in most cases. And also I think that the thing that uh, just astounds me about this game the most um, after so many plays of it is that like what Stefan Feld has created here is almost like, I don't know how else to put this, but it's it like almost feels like, you know, a, uh, a machine that you put in inputs and then it every single turn it prevent presents you a brand new 
very satisfying puzzle to solve. Like it's like it's like almost like like he's created like like here's a brand new Sudoku puzzle, I like guess, or something yeah. like that. Um, where just with such simple inputs, a couple of dice, four different actions um, that you can that you can do on your turn. It it's it's amazing how even after uh, fifty play, I played this game fifty times last year, <laughs> so I know I have played it fifty times at least. Um, even after fifty plays, you know it it's very rare that my my turn feels obvious. Uh, it always feels good. Like I feel like I'm making smart decisions. Um, and I, and you know, I feel like I really understand the puzzle. Like I understand what I'm trying to do. I can make really smart choices. I, you know, I win a lot of the games I play online. I went in, in with friends. Uh, so I, I know I'm making smart choices, but I'm rarely ever walk away from the turn thinking that was definitely the best choice. You know, mm. it, it's there, there's like enough fuzziness there that you can't quite comp right it's not knowable but at the same time it feels solvable and i don't know i like i feel like i'm really butchering this but that's and that's why i haven't ever written this article because i don't know how mm. to convey that but there's something about that in this game that is unlike any other for just creating these perfect little like morsels of like here's a fantastic new choice. Here's a fantastic new choice. And just like over and over again throughout the whole game. I have so many thoughts on the sort of two, I feel like you just made two separate things that I have responses to. So one is the sort of, I feel like that the engine that Stefan Feld's created is the sort of overlapping of these brilliant systems where they're always, the game itself does such a good job of creating, uh, of having these really simple, really, really simple systems that are constantly overlapping in interesting ways that keep it feeling fresh. And then that is paired with just the right amount of uncertainty, not just in the dice, right? Not just in your inputs, but also like uncertainty in the tiles that could come out or the goods that you'll be able to get or in what your opponents will do, on what their your turn. opponents will do. Yeah. All of these things that make it so hard to be sure <laughs> that both makes it your, all of your decisions feel rewarding and exciting, but also keep you really engaged and wanting to keep making them and seeing how they play out. And I do really think that for me, the, the, the true, the true sort of what makes the castles of Burgundy, as you said, sort of like nearly, if not a perfect Euro game. And I, I agree. I think this game's just amazing. Um, there's, there's little elements we haven't talked about, but I, I really think the simplicity of the turn structure and then the complexity that blossoms from it is just so good because really your the four core actions are a veneer for enabling tons of other actions throughout the game and then it's the way in which the dice are integrated everywhere on makes it so easy to learn but makes the game design so harmonious at the same time Ab absolutely and it makes it also an easier game to teach and get people into than it really has any right to be, I think. Because really, I mean, this is, to me, a pretty solidly, like, mid midweight game. There's a lot yeah. going on here, a lot of different tiles. Um, but, you know, you can tell people, hey, these are the four actions. They're all really easy to understand. And and you're pretty much up and running. You know, and that, that's sort of how I like to teach the game is, like explain the action to say, you know, here's all these tiles. You can look at this little key on your board that kind of gives you an idea of what's going on, but we'll just kind of explain them as they come up. Um, and, you know, you, you can teach the game that way and get into it really quick with, with some new, especially like new gamers, non-gamers. You know, I really feel like it's, it's grokable in a way that so many other games kind of in this category that offers, you know, equally satisfying choices are just not, they just feel yeah. way too much. 
when I first played the Castles of Burgundy, I found having to look up the effects of all the tiles, even on the game board and like necessarily knowing what they do, burdensome. Like I just right. did. But the more I've played it, the more I understand what a boon that system is for the game, because there's so many more than four actions in the game. The four action system is a gateway to get to all of the other potential actions that are locked behind these different tiles in some ways, especially with the building tiles, right? So it enables more interesting dynamic turns by sort of putting actions behind actions and sort of almost obfuscating it, obfuscating it just enough that the mental load for some reason, right? If you were just presented with a lot of options and it sort of said do A then do B, I feel like it would be more complex in some way than like, these are the four core actions. And yeah, if you add these tiles, they'll do these other powers. Yeah. And a lot of games do this. It's not like this isn't just to ca- specific to Castles of Burgundy, but there's something about the pacing that I think makes it work especially well too. Uh, absolutely. And it's so interesting because I think you're exactly right. There, it's There's some kind of like cognitive dissonance between like, if you're like, Hey, there's 16 different things you could do on your turn <laughs> yeah. versus there are four things you could do on your turn. And like, oh yeah, sure, you could like play your boat and the boat does this, but that's like that's not you, that's the boat kind of doing its own thing. That just happens, yeah. you know, and it it really makes it seem so much simpler. Um Yeah. I mean, also I do think, you know, we don't get too heavy into kind of the production design, and I haven't even uh, interacted with the second edition of this game or whatever the newest edition of this game in person i've got the old school Aaliyah one uh, but on those player boards have you, have you played with that version of the game i have yeah so, do, you, do you know what i'm talking about like with each of the tile it gives you like a little um summary a little picture of what it does uh and i think that the iconography is very good uh, for explaining what things do um you know you, you can't just look at it and know but once you know it's enough that you can look at it and be reminded totally once you speak castles of burgundy you you've got it it's right. it's there for you and yep. it's a game like that you will always be able to pick up and play again without you know having to do too much relearning from the rule book because there just aren't any um there are there you know there aren't any caveat really or like special exceptions exceptions uh which i think are the things that so often bog games down and make them hard to relearn even a game you love uh, you know when you pull it back out and you're like oh yeah like there's, there's all these like other like nested clauses i guess i have to like reread the whole rule book if i want to play that and I think that's partially the beauty of the really simple systems driven design of interlocking all these clever systems is it prevents a lot of that exception edge cases from coming into play and just lets the systems emergently play with each other. Absolutely. So what do you think is the most interesting decision that you get um, in a game of Castles of Burgundy? Oh, this is such a hard question, Jake. There's, I feel like this game is so stimulating in so many different areas. Um, but I think, and it's hard because all of your decisions are coming from your dice. So yeah. they all go back to round one, to the same point. Do you, if, can I pick one really quickly? Yeah. For me, the most interesting decision is jumping, trying to figure out my path through my player board based on the tiles that come out. So I know that because of the points that are, you're going to get the two different scale of points, your, your base points when you finish a space that are triangular in nature. So uh, they go up at uh, intervals that reward you significantly for them getting larger without being exponential. So you want to finish bigger spaces, but then you have the linear decreasing points for each round. So if you finish an, a, any contiguous area in round one, you get 10, then eight, then six, then four, then two. So those two things mixed creates such an interesting puzzle from where your first castle is and figuring out how to spread out for me that decision and always revisiting that hypothesis or being forced in a different direction just because oh my like i said oh it's not going to be a veranda it's going to be a porch because your dreams sort of fall to pieces because the tiles just don't come out or you 
they got drafted instead of you. I think for me, that strategic path through my physical space of tiling is the most interesting decision. How about you? Yeah, that's that's interesting because you're sort of combining the decision of taking tiles and playing mm. tiles together. <laughs> <laughs> that's interesting brendan because you're just saying the game is interesting <laughs> very interesting no i i i do i, I mean that's such a s- smart way of making the game feel more interactive than it really is too um because you really feel the race right mm, i think a yeah. lot of games that can be you know, point salad Euro games um, that that can be described as multiplayer solitaire. You know, this game there are certainly elements of interact interaction because turn order matters, taking tiles from shared supply matters, but it's certainly closer to the multiplayer solitaire side of things um, than the other end of the spectrum, in my opinion. And I think those games can often a lot of times people say, you know, oh, there's like not enough interaction and people are certainly entitled, you know, you like what you like. There's, there's nothing wrong with somebody saying that, but, you know, I've always felt that, you know, those games can be really compared to like running a race. Right. Um, Which certainly that's an individual sport. You're running your own race. You know, you're not supposed to be, uh, I don't know, kicking your competitors in the calf as you run by. (laughs) Um, But the the fact that there's other people there, right? There's other people setting the pace. There's other people trying to pass you makes the, that experience still feel interactive. And I think Castles of Burgundy really leans into that um, because it, the fact that you want to complete areas early makes tempo so hugely important and that you're literally racing with uh, your competitors to be the first person to complete all of, fill in all of your hexes of any one color uh, to, to get that you know superiority token first makes it like a literal race. So I think that kind of concept of this, you know, that you're always interacting, you're always knowing, paying attention to what your opponent's doing is is really reinforced with that decision. So I, I definitely agree. Uh, and I think maybe part of why you're so attracted uh, to kind of mapping your way through the game, mapping the way through your board is because of this like overarching feeling of like, I'm, I'm in a race, like I have to do this right or somebody's going to get ahead. Definitely. And it is a race where you're kicking each other in the calves. Yeah, you are. Yeah. 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 And and that's partially what makes it so fun. Like you're saying, and I, I feel like I said it doesn't feel bad earlier. And I think you were right in pointing out that sometimes it really does feel bad. But I think mostly it just... it. <sighs> I, I don't know. There's always because of the way the hexes work and all of the spaces, there's always a lot of options, even when you've pared down. And I just feel like it. I, I don't know. The decisions are so good. Can I just say one other decision? Because yeah. I just the decision of when to sell goods. I am really drawn to. Um, I I feel like it almost feels like a push your luck in some ways. Not always because it's it's just this like little thing hanging in the back of your mind because your points with your goods are tied to goods sold are tied to the number of players in the game. So if you're playing a two player game, you always get one point for goods sold. A three player game, you always get three points per goods sold. A four player game, uh four points per goods sold. Yeah, that's right. Um and so and there's no, uh, despite how a lot of the other scoring works, there's no sense of urgency outside of, I really need to do this before the game ends. Um, <laughs> and just, and, and in some ways the game says, maybe you just want to wait. Like maybe don't ship your goods yet. You could just stack more on there uh, and then you'd get more points. And there is, you're getting less silver. You won't get silver if you do that um, because you have to sell to get a silver. And no matter how many goods you sell, you always get one silver, goods of one type. Um, but I just think that decision ends up being really interesting of like, okay, are there 
any good styles that could even potentially come out that would incentivize me to want to build more on this spot? Do I need to try to get silver? Because getting silver and buying more tiles is an important part of the tempo game also. So there's just, there's a lot, like if everyone's selling goods, then it's like, okay, maybe I need to ship out some goods to buy some tiles. Um, I don't know. It, it's very interesting. Yeah, it is. And the the only reason you might want to sell them earlier rather than waiting is that does close down your ability to put a different colored good sure. tile. So you have a limited uh, supply, right, of, of three possible spaces. You can only hold three colors of goods at one time, which, again, is is just another trade-off, which are sprinkled throughout this game of, of waiting to collect one good. Um, but the way you collect goods from the board is uh, you take all of the different goods out of one bay, so if you're waiting and waiting and waiting, there's a good chance that uh, you're wasting efficiency later in the game by like when you have the opportunity to take two or three different tiles. If you can only take one because your other areas are full, uh, well, then you're just leaving value out there on the board. So yeah, again, the game is is asking you to to make those trade-offs. And I think for me, the most interesting decision uh, just kind of hone in on it is choosing when to what tile to take i think Mm. that is for me like the epicenter of this kind of explosion of decisions right you really want to factor everything in to that choice um you know where can this fit on my board what numbers will that open up for me or close down what types of tile like colors of tile spaces will that open up for me uh, what are other people taking? You know, who else is going for these tiles? Should I be, you know, trying to accomplish this big space of tiles or should I be doing something else? And I think, you know, every time you take a tile from the board, there are, there are so many different things that you may want to consider. And some of those things are going to be really, really important. And other things, you know, they may not ultimately uh, be that big of a deal. So trying to like parse all this information uh, any anytime you select, select a tile, I think is what for me makes the, the decision of how to map out your whole turn so rich. One thing I, I completely agree, Jake, and e- this system is so good. And one thing that I think is so interesting about the way this system works that we would be remiss not to mention in terms of our podcast and the frame that we have is the way that the game. So the workers are a really interesting mechanic in terms of opening and closing a potential decision space, uh, the potential decision tree. Uh, your the workers increase how many choices you have, and I would say more than a lot of games, the blurriness between choices and decisions, decisions being. Um, the best decision based out the best choice that you can make in terms of pushing you closer towards victory uh, or the and choices not really being options that you can take that are pushing you meaningfully towards victory over the potential decisions that you have i would say more often than most games because of the uncertainty there's a lot of fuzziness there between the the what are decisions and what are choices and when you should be using those tiles and why you should be making certain decisions over others especially in the early game when things are very open and there's a lot of uncertainty before you yeah that's such a good point and i mean i think the important kind of heuristic i use when playing this game is that you always want to be taking and placing tiles though that most of the points in this game come from your board right so if you are able to take tiles from the board as an action or place tiles uh, from your board as your action like that is advancing you towards victory anything else is like you better have a really good reason uh, why you're choosing to do those actions. And, and there, and I mean, the reason that this game is great is because there are tons of reasons why on any given turn you may want to, uh, okay, well, it's the first round. It's so important that I get a mine online early. So I'm going to 
you know, do something horribly inefficient on this first turn to spend workers so that I can pick up a mine so that nobody else can get it. And that, you know, is, is a great opening, you know, that is worth it, even though, you know, I just told you, like, you shouldn't use the worker thing. And now I'm saying like, okay, but on the first turn, maybe go for it. Um, Right. Or I have to use workers because I know this other person might take that tile or I have to ship this good now because I really need that silver piece to take this from the black market. Right. There's tons of times when you break that heuristic. Um, But as a baseline, you should be taking tiles and you should be putting them on your board. So I think the times that 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 it, that there could be a choice in this game, something you can do that's just not viable, are pretty few and far between because there's so many uh, so many cases. But they would be those times when like you could take a tile or place one efficiently, but for some reason you know you're choosing not to, right? Like spending workers to to sell a good when you're not able to buy something from the black market anyway. Like something like that sounds really bad almost all the time, but you kind of have to work for it. Yeah. I also love that you, you sort of touched on something there, Jake, that I, I want to hone in on. And that's the, the dynamic nature of the value of tiles based on the time within the turn order in the game in which you would take them so like mines start off very good and precipitously precipitously get worst worse just based on how they play and they're usually coming in small groupings because you don't want very many of them castles are like always really strong objectively just great you're filling in your board you're getting a free a free move of anything just like awesome tile animal tiles can 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 be can range from like two points to 10 or more <laughs> points um the ship tiles because of the way the goods work uh placing a ship tile could give you very little besides advance you in terms of the board if there's no valid goods you could take or it could get you three goods at once yeah. um and the and ships, the, oh sorry fin- I'll no, you, finish your list. well and then like the knowledge tiles are that way too early on there's certain knowledge tiles that are amazing and then there's other knowledge tiles that early on feel like a bet like the ones that give you four points for every type of a specific type of a building you have taking that early you're like oh i'm really committing to doing this and i'm giving myself a vulnerability where other players can see that i want those buildings and will draft from me but then getting those later feels good and a lot of the action driven knowledge tiles um that allow you to do things uh, if you get those early oh my gosh, they can be so good and feel very powerful and shape your whole strategy. And late in the game, taking one as a concession just to fill in uh, a knowledge cluster uh, grouping can just feel really bad. Like it it feels kind of suboptimal and buildings are just all over the place. There's just like some of this and some of that. And I I think that's a real strength of the game too is not all tiles are always equally as good. Yeah, great point. Um, and I think you did a really good job to point out sort of the dynamic nature of those tiles. Uh, and, and what's cool is different tiles, right? Like the animal tiles, their dynamic value is based upon you, right? Your board, the decisions you've made. Where ships, for instance, are often really based upon your opponent. Uh, and a sh- the way that the turn order uh changes is really interesting where you've got a track and whoever's furthest along the track uh is the first player whoever's furthest back is the last player but if you ever are to catch up to somebody on the track you put your piece on top of theirs meaning you overtake them which creates the opportunity that a single playing a single ship could take you from last player to first player which is a humongous value, meaning you know you'll you essentially in that case would would get to take two turns in a row, um, and right, which is which is fantastic, right? Because that means it's it, if you're last in a four person game, it's possible that six tiles could get picked off of the board before you even get a chance to go. Uh, so turn order really matters. And then on the other hand, right, if based on the way the game goes and, and how aggressively other people are taking shipping, uh, a shipping tile could mean you go from fourth place to still in fourth place, right? And it's just not worth that much to you at that point. Um, you know, and I used to think like the castles 
I think I even used to like tell players when they're like learning the game, like the castle is the best pile. If you see one of mm. it, you should always take it. But as I've played more, like, you know, I've, I've encountered many situations, usually in, in the late game where yeah. taking a castle tile, you know, even though it gives you a free action is not as good as, uh, you know, to your example, Maybe it's taking the last available knowledge tile that even though it's not going to help you, it's not going to give you any value from the special rule or action at all, is going to enable you to complete an area that you otherwise would not. Uh, you know, so, and that just shows you like the the range that can uh, a value in the space of the tile that could be literally a zero for you, do nothing for you, could be better in, in, in many situations in Castles of Burgundy than the tile, which gives you the ability to do any action in the game for free. And I think that range is so much of why in the beginning of the podcast, Jake, you were saying, I don't know why the decisions always feel so interesting. And I think that's why that's the secret sauce that's making you layered over the dice rolling system that creates these sort of forced, interesting decisions makes it so endlessly interesting because you can't grok it it's different it's different every time it has to be i think we'd be remiss before we come to the end of this podcast not to talk about um the dice because i do think that is we've we've mentioned dice a couple of times but that also is a really interesting layer that lays atop that any decision you make in this game which is that Almost all of these actions, with the exception of uh, claiming workers, which we've already discussed, it's not something you really want to do, are contingent upon the dice you roll. Um, and the workers, you know, you could, in many cases, you could use a dice to get worker that would allow you to increase or decrease the die to, to do something. But in, in so many cases, I think that the dice really allow you to hone in on a grokable decision space, right? If you could just do anything in this game at any time, that also might make the game feel much more complex. But because the dice give you these really important constraints to work in, like I think the puzzle feels so much more satisfying. I don't know. Does that make sense? It definitely does. And I think you mentioning the workers here in the context of the dice is so important to me because I feel like a lesser game wouldn't have allowed the sixes to wrap around to ones um, by using a worker to add or decrease one from the value, which if you don't do that in this game, you create a hierarchy, right? Where like ones and sixes, the distance between those values and any other number is significantly greater th uh, than it would be if you can wrap around, which then makes the distance between any numbers equal because it's a circle instead of a just a line right between values. So like if you roll it, if you don't have workers where you can roll over your s difference between a six and a one is huge. So the flexibility in the system isn't there. So all of a sudden, you know that your sixes and your ones on your board are they're as likely to come up, but they, they would be much less flexible in terms of outcomes. It's harder to get uh, from them. And I think that having all the values just be equal in terms of what is rolled is so interesting and so good for the game um, in a way that's just brilliant. Yeah. And it doesn't feel like there's that much luck in this game. Yeah. Which is amazing for a game where literally every single action you will do on your turn is based on random <laughs> input of 2d6. Yep. And I mean, you know, and it really, you know, it doesn't feel like there can be there, there, you know, over the course of the game, there'll be rolls you want. You're like, okay, I really hope I roll a five here so that I can, can place this, uh, you know, tile where I need, uh, and maybe roll a five, maybe you don't. It's like the, luck does come into it and it is possible to get, you know, better or worse rolls over the course of the game. I've, I've noted that games where you roll doubles a lot can be mm. much more challenging to do well because you just have a lot less flexibility. Uh, so that's kind of funny, uh, a game system where like doubles are like the bad, only bad outcome. <laughs> in yeah. 
Um, so it's not to say that there isn't luck sure. in the game. Of course there is. But the system is like so robust and like deterministic enough that you can almost always work around any situation. You know, I I feel like the the more skilled player has as much a leg up in this game as as they would in you know something much more deterministic like i don't know an el grande or something like that i feel like a big part of that too is uh, one thing i think w- that i've been thinking about a lot in the past week and we, we haven't had the chance to talk about yet that i would love to explore in a future episode is the the just the actual scope the number of decisions that you make in a game and i think one thing that really helps the castles of burgundy is your dice are personal and you're going to get 50 outcomes the there's 25 turns in the game and you get two rolls of each on every turn so you get 50 die outcomes and i think that goes really far into reducing potential randomness because that's a lot of that's a lot of instances of of the die being rolled yeah that's a that's a great point and in many other games right like a combat game maybe you only have like five or six fights right sure and and each of those die outcomes in there you know lo- losing five of the six which is not very far out of the prob- possibility uh you know that is going to be a devastating result but you know getting a handful of bad die results here is not it's just going to be a small a small scuff to your overall game and even if using the workers feels bad, just by them existing means that there are correct times to use them and gives you interesting decisions in terms of when to use your your outcomes to smooth the randomness and the luck. And I think that's where a lot of the agency, of course, comes from, too. Can I say one other thing about dice that wouldn't come into play in terms of you caught to play at all? Sure. When you're playing at the table, one thing that I miss so much about this game is it feels so good to be the first player, even just be, in terms of playing digitally, because you get to go first. But when you're the first player in physical and you just get to be the one who's given the extra white die oh, that yeah. you roll. So there's an extra white die that is not any player's die and it doesn't play into your inputs. It's literally just dictating what depot the goods go to every at the start of each round. Um Something about that is just so fun. Like, oh, I'm first player and I have this special responsibility where I get to roll an extra die. And it's just, I love that about this game. It's fun. It's super fun. Yeah, that's a great point. I I don't almost, it's been a while since I played this in person. I had almost forgot about the white die. The other thing that's amazing about the die is that because everyone rolls it along the first player turn, it's the game telling you without telling you like, hey, like you should really like pre-plan what you're going to do here. And I think that's just another super smart design decision that makes making decisions on your turn feel a lot more satisfying because you don't have to, you don't have that same like time pressure. Uh, I guess, I guess if you're the first player you do, but then you have the most options, right? And it's a lot easier to make those choices. Or if you're the last player, you really have a lot of time to think about it where you don't have to feel that burn of like, oh, geez, am I taking too long? Uh, Are people like looking at me? Uh, I should probably just like do this. You know, you get a better, more of a chance to really grapple with that puzzle and appreciate it. It's another instance of that randomness and the the potential for it to create a lack of agency, a design decision that increased the feeling of agency, because since everyone rolls their dice at the start of each uh, turn, you can look at everyone's dice and you can make informed decisions. Yeah, definitely. All right. Uh, let's do a couple just last questions, quick ones to end on. Okay. So what is your favorite tile in the game and why? I think this is a super Timmy answer, but I, I I just like the animals. I just want all the pigs or all the sheep, and I want to score 16 points for placing a fourth pig when I already have four pigs in there, and I just want to just get them all nicely together, and it just feels great. What, what about you, Jake? I think my favorite um, is probably the science style, just because they add mm. so much diversity into the game. And I think a lot of times, like taking one or two <laughs> early can really change the game you're playing. Um, Such a spike. 
Yeah, and <laughs> and also like I I just have to say like I think the animal only because you said that I think the animal tiles are like by far the worst tiles in the game <laughs> for just like. <laughs> For like trying to be like a try hard competitive person like me, like they're they're the ones Such I'm like. Spike. I guess I'll take this stupid four pig, but because like I have to. But it if you just think about it, right, it like it as soon as you take one, it telegraphs right. It, you're the most vulnerable. Yeah, yeah. It, it's you know you're never gonna get to finish that five tile animal farm with all pigs this is not gonna work out that's why i called them the timmy tiles but i just want to get all my pigs together it just feels good the dream i love the dream of the veranda even if i have to settle for my porch of pigs and chickens and sheep all together yeah i've i've i mean it it can be done it can be done uh so i mean you gave this game a 9.5 out of 10 that's really high I think yeah. th- that makes this our collectively highest. Maybe El Grande was higher. I can't remember. It's up they there. have to be right there. Neck and yeah. Neck. So what? If you could distill it down, like what do you think makes Castles of Burgundy special? Why do you think it is a game that you know, ten years on, um, is still probably one of if you're you know on the Dice Tower Facebook page or Reddit board games it's still a game that is just constantly brought up and recommended it for all kinds of people why do you think that is what's this so what makes this so special we've been pretty cerebral in sort of our analysis a lot uh, of this episode and trying to unpack the different systems and i think i'm going to take a slightly different approach and just say i think partially what makes the castles of burgundy so special is just the fact that it feels good to play. It feels good to roll the dice. It feels good to fill in your board. It feels good to make the hard decisions that you don't know are always the right decisions. It feels good to be hate drafted sometime. It's a $20 game. We don't even talk about price very much. This is like a really affordable game and there's so much game hiding in there. Um, It plays fairly quickly too. I just, I think that for me, I don't know why, but it just it, it activates so many different parts of my brain and there's so much fun. And maybe it's just also that it appeals so differently to s- different people, too. Like, I like the knowledge tiles, Jake. I think they they do so much for the game. Like, I like when I get one early and it can really inform my strategy. But I wouldn't say that I find them super fun. And I think that's another really cool aspect of the game is there's a lot of room for different things to be equally viable what do you think makes the castle of burgundy so special yeah i I don't want to disagree with anything you've said because i think that's a really smart way of putting it so just to echo that and say the first time i played this game i i have like this is my like desert island game Mm. right It, it just has that feeling where in the first play, you get to appreciate it enough that you start to re- like realize like there's a lot here, right? This is, you know, I don't know, maybe I'm alone in that, but I don't think so because it's like such a highly regarded game. But from from that first play on, you're like, okay, this is like a game I just know I could play over and over and over again. Uh, and I have. <laughs> <laughs> and I've never stopped playing it. Uh, and it's still, you know, a top three game for me. Uh, and I really don't expect that to change. I mean, all all good things must come to an end. I mean, Steffenfeld's still out there designing great games. So, you know, never say never. But, you know, from it's it's been my number one or two game since the first time I played it. I I feel like it's it sounds to me like Jake you're going to be chasing that one tile down perfect game for many years yeah. and when you finally get there then you'll go do all the math and say was it really a perfect game are there more points I could have squeezed out of these systems and maybe that's what it is too it it's a game that lets you dream uh, and be happy with what you accomplish at the end even if you couldn't accomplish your dreams and that's a pretty cool game yeah. As one single tear rolls down my face, I look up from my board at my smiling friends and I say, y'all want to go again? 
<laughs> Should that just be the end of the episode? Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you for listening to this week's episode of Decision Space. Probably no outro music. So, Brendan, why don't you just kind of give him a, a little uh, diddle, ditty? Do, 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 do. Oh, God. It's nothing like what it's supposed to be. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I was like trying to remember how our intro and outro music went, but I like, I can't. I can't. It's like electronic music, so it's like hard to. <laughs> oh <my God>. <laughs> <laughs> what was that? Okay, right, let's sorry about your ears, y'all. Okay, follow us on Board Game Geek, I guess. <laughs> also on Discord. Also, if you have thoughts on the Castles of Burgundy, we want to hear them from you. We also have a Twitter. If you think we should use it more, you should tweet at us more. And uh, next week, for all of our pre-planners out there, give me that fish, Jake. It's going to be, hey, that's my fish, right? Oh, yeah, right? let's do it. I can't wait. We're going to squeeze a whole episode out of it. Oh, I think I think it'll be easier than you think. <laughs> good. All right. Have a good week, y'all. Bye. <laughs>